Unitarians from Micronics Networking and Training where we conduct CCIE and other Cisco classes. I was flattered when Cisco Learning Networks asked me to do this little presentation for you all. So I'm going to take a small example of our official cert guide for CCIE routing and switching version 5.0 and walk you through LDP configuration. So let's get going. So let's say we have four routers here. So we have So now let's say we want 
want to run labels. Now, why do I do so? Why do I want to run labels? We'll talk about this a little later. Here we have choices as well. We have an obsolete choice, which is called Tag Distribution Protocol, or TDP. Or we have an industry standard uh, choice, it's called LDP, Label Distribution Protocol. Now, LIP, or a, a Label Distribution Protocol, or LDP, runs in the control plane, just like OSDF. Now, what does LDP do for us? LDP populates the labels in a table called LIB, or lib, lib uh, Label Information List. Now, this guy, LDP, will do a route table lookup, and it will originate, it will assign a label to each and every route it sees in the routing table. Then what it'll do is, it'll uh, take the IP to label binding, and it will put that binding in a special table called lib. Label information list. Now, in many ways, LDP reminds me of OSPF. Now, in OSPF, initially, we do a neighbor discovery. Once we discover our directly connected neighbors, then we're going to establish an OSPF adjacency with these neighbors. We do the same thing in LDP. In LDP, we do a neighbor discovery. In that process, we use UDP 646 as the source and as the destination. And once we discover these neighbors, then we're going to establish an LDP session with these neighbors. In that process, we're going to use TCP 646. Now, how do we configure OSPF? In a global config mode, we're going to say router, OSPF, a process, and we're going to use network statement to run OSPF on the links that interconnect the routers. Now, we do the same thing in configuring LDP. In a global config mode, I'm going to configure the routers with MPLS, label protocol, LDP, and I'm going to run LDP on these links using MPLS IP Connect. For example, I'm going to go to router 1. On this interface of router 1, I'm going to use MPLS IP. On these two interfaces of router 2, I'm going to do MPLS IP. I'm going to do the same thing on these two interfaces, and of course, configure MPLS IP on this interface. Now, in OSPF, we have a router IP. If one is not statically configured, it will take the numerically highest IP address of any loopback interface. If one does not exist, then it will take the highest IP address configured on that device. Well, LDP does the same thing. LDP goes through the same process to choose a router ID. But how do we configure router ID in OSPF? We're going to go on the router OSPF, and we're going to say router-ID, and we're going to use a router ID. In OSPF, the router ID is not an IP address. I would say my router ID is 0001 for router 1, 2 for router 2, and so forth and so on. But in LDP, the router ID is an IP address, and it must be reachable. It must be reachable for these guys to establish an LDP session. Now, in some ways, this LDP reminds me of the old frame relay. Now, in frame relay, we were using DELCs. In LDP, we use labels. In frame relay, the first usable DELC was DELC 16, and the very last usable DELC was 1007. That's if we were using Cisco LMIs. In LDP, the first usable label is once again 16, and the last usable label is 1,048,575, basically 2 to the power of 20 minus 15. Why minus 15? Just like uh, frame relay, where DLC 0 to 15 were reserved, 
in LDP, labels 0 to 15 are reserved. So let's talk a little bit about the labels. So let me wipe this board. If we go with the default behavior, these routers will assign the very first label to this prefix here. The first usable label is 16, which means router 1 will choose 16, router 2 will choose 16, so would routers 3 and 4. Now when we first study LDP, this can be pretty confusing. Even though it doesn't really matter and uh, labels are locally significant, but it can be confusing. Which 16 was originated by which router over here? So for that reason, what I'm going to do is I'm going to arrange these labels. How do we arrange these labels? I'm going to go to the global config mode of these routers and I'm going to say MPLS label range 100 to 199 on router 1, 200 to 299 on router 3, 300 to 399 on router 4, and obviously 400 to 499 on router 4. Now, why would I want to do this? So if you see a label in the lid, if you see a label in this range, you know exactly which LSR or label switch router originated that label. Now, we don't do this in the real world environment. If any, we would want to extend the range. Now, you cannot extend the range uh, more than 1,048,575. So, what am I saying about extending the range? On a low-end Cisco routers, such as 3725s, 2811s, 1841s, and even 1900s, the by default, the labels start with 16, and they go all the way up to 100,000. For example, if uh, I remember this correctly, on a 6500 switches, it starts with 16 and it goes to 353,000. But that doesn't mean that this is all these guys can do. We could actually use this command to increase the range from their default range to their maximum about, uh, allowable value. How do we do this? Well, we're gonna go to one of these routers or a switch. We're gonna say MPLS label range Space 16, if you put a space question mark, you would see that the last allowable value is 1,048,575. So let's see how these guys are going to assign labels and how these labels are advertised. So let me wipe this board a little bit. an IP 
impacted, I'm going to check the content of fib. If I receive a label packet, we're going to check the content of lfib. So let's go through this. Let's test this. So once again, I'm going to stand over here, and I'm going to ping this IP address. So when I ping, router 4 receives an IP packet. So router 4 is going to check the content of fib. If I freeze this process, and I go to router 4 and do a show IP self, 1.1.1.0 slash 24 space detail, it will tell me that I'm going to impose label 300, I'm going to send you out of this interface, I'm going to send you to this next hop. So now, what we have is an IP packet that came in, now it's going to leave as a label packet. So when router 3 receives a label packet is going to have to check the content of LFIB. LFIB will tell this router that if you're coming in with a top label of 300, I'm going to swap you with label 200. I'm going to send you out of this interface to this next hop. Now router 2 is going to get a label packet. It's going to check the content of LFIB. LFIB says, if you're coming in with label 200, I'm going to swap you with label 100. Label 100 here. I'm going to send you out of here to this next hop. So now this guy, this poor guy, since he's going to get a label packet, he has to do two table lookups. He's going to have to check the content of LFIB, pop the label, now he has an IP packet, now he has to do a recursive look into a FIB, or not a recursive look, but another lookup in the FIB, and FIB is going to tell it to exit out of here. Go and you're dead. So we see the light router that originated that prefix. This poor guy has to do two table lookups. So for that reason, they came up with this process. The process is called penultimate. Penultimate meaning second last. Hop. This is the hop. Hopper. Meaning that, or PHP for short. Meaning that router two is going to be my PHP router. Router 2 is going to pop the label and give me an IP packet. Now, how does that help? Let's walk through this. So, in this case, when Router 1 advertises a prefix, they will advertise the prefix with a pop action. The pop action is label number 3. Label number 3 is a set of instructions that will tell the local LSR to pop that uh, label. So, now he's going to get a pop. So let's see how this helps. I'm going to be here. I'm going to ping 1.1.1.1. Router 4 is going to receive an IP packet. He's going to check the content of FIB. FIB will impose, or SAP will impose label 300. It will send this guy out of this interface to this next hop. D is going to get a label packet with a top label of 300. He will down, he's going to do a LFIB table lookup. And help people say, if you're coming in with label 300, I'm going to swap you with label 200. I'm going to send you out of this interface to this next hop. Now, obviously, router 2 is going to get a label packet. He's going to have to check the content of LFIB. And LFIB would say, if you're coming in with label 200, I'm going to pop that label on the way out of this interface to this next hop. So now, this router, router 1, will get an IP packet. And because of that, he does a single table lookup to forward the packet out of that to a back interface. This process is called an ultimate hop hop. So now, the big question. One, or why do we need labels? Let me wipe this more and we'll explain why we need labels. So let's say we have three routers here. network 
show IP DGP on Route 3, I'm going to see that for 1000. Now, this only means that the control plane worked. Now, let's test the data plane. Can Route 3 ping this network, a host on this network? The answer is no. Why? Because it's going to fail right over here. Router 2 is not aware of this network. This network was advertised in IDG. So even though the control plane worked, the data plane failed. But what's going to happen if we establish a GRE tunnel from here to here? And I'm going to establish my IDG session based on the source and destination IP address of this tunnel. Can routers 1 and 3 establish an IBGP peer session with each other? And the answer is once again yes. Can router 1 advertise this network in IBGP to router 3? Sure it can. But can router 3 now ping one a host on this network? In this case, yes. Why? Because it's going through the tunnel. Now, what if I told you LDP was nothing but a tunnel? So what is one major benefit over here? This router in the middle is going to have two networks in his routing table as a directly connected networks. 12.110 and 23.110. These two end routers or edge routers can exchange 100,000 routes. They could actually exchange more than 100,000 routes if they wanted to. And this router in the middle is not going to be aware of those routes. He's only going to have two routes over here. And if you look at the MPLS, now, from MPLS's perspective, the core of my MPLS is going to be BGP free. So what I've done is, by establishing this connection, my Muscle routers, my BP routers are pushed to the edges, and the core router is sitting there just doing label swap. Now, I know that this was a short discussion, but if you need to learn more about MPLS, I suggest that you pick up a copy of our official certification guide for CCI routing and switching version 5.0, because in that book we have more detailed information about LDP or even MPLS 